to the Brazos Valley, UUCBV, or Brazos UU for short. My name is Molly Hagen Ward, and I'm joined today by my daughter Juna and my son Eli, and I'm serving as your worship assistant today. We are a welcoming congregation, which means we celebrate and welcome all people of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. We also strive to welcome people across diverse views of race, age, ability, immigration status, and belief. We're also a congregation working for reproductive justice. So whoever you are, wherever you have come from, and wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Our call to worship this morning comes from the gray hymnal. If you want to read along, it's number 421. It's from the Hebrew Bible, Psalm 98. Oh, sing a new song to the eternal. Shout praise all earth. Break into music and song. Praise the eternal with a lyre, with lyre and song. Let the sea and all within it thunder praise, the world and its inhabitants. Let rivers clap their hands, let mountains sing in chorus. Oh, sing a new song to the eternal. Please. Say our chalice lighting words with me. We have up here on the screen. We light the chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, as a beacon of hope for all who seek justice, dignity, and compassion, and in celebration of the life of truth and meaning we share together. Now, all please join me in saying our affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and the service is its gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another.
son to come on up for our time for all ages. So you can sit crisscross applesauce if you want to. I said young in part too. All right. Are you going to be All right. Today at the front, we have a wonder box. Does anybody know what a wonder box is? It's a box, and you wonder what's inside of it. All right. So, Clark, do you want to be my volunteer and give the box a little shake? Okay, let's listen. Hmm. It sounds noisy. Does anybody have a guess what it might be? If you have a guess, turn to your neighbor and tell them. Shake it again. I want to hear a guess. I heard over here somewhere somebody said something that was in the right direction. Ooh, who said crayons? Molly is closed. Let's open it up. What's inside, Clark? Can you hold it up? Can you hold it up? I thought it was uh, close. All right, I'll hold it up for you. So we have colored pencils, but they're not just regular colored pencils. They're people colored pencils. Did you know that they now make colored pencils for every shade of human being in the world? Does any of you who are sitting up here, probably not down there, remember what color was labeled flesh in old boxes of crayons? Peach. Woo, right? It was peach. peach. Yeah, it got changed to the name Peach in 1962. I had to look it up because I was like, this is so fascinating. The concept of flesh changes over time. But we know, right, that not everyone is peach. In fact, most of the people around the world aren't peach, right? Um, so Crayola decided to make a People of the World collection. But is our skin color the most important thing about us? No. What do you think? No. What does the audience think? I said audience. The congregation. <laughs> what do you think? No, no. We do know that representation matters. But remember, our skin color is not the most important thing about us. And to help illustrate that point, we're going to read a story called Skin Again by Bell Hooks. So Corinne, if you turn this way, you can look up at the sea, the, sea, the wall, and you can see our lovely pictures. All right, Skin Again by Bell Hooks. The skin I'm in is just a covering. It cannot tell my story. The skin I'm in is just a covering. If you want to know who I am, you have got to come inside and open your heart way wide. The skin I'm in looks good to me. It will let you know one small way to trace my identity. But then again, the skin I'm in will always be just a covering. It cannot tell my story. If you want to know who I am, you have got to come inside. Be with me inside the me of me, all made up of stories present, past, and future. Some true to life and others all fun and fantasy all the ways I imagine me. You can find all about me coming close and letting go of who you might think I am. Before you come inside and let me be real and you become real to me. All real then, and that place where skin again is one small way to see me but not real enough to be all the me of me or the you of you. For we are all inside 
made up of real history, real dreams, and the stuff of all we hope for when we can be all real together on the inside. So the color of a person's skin is a small part of a person's identity, but it's also a really important part. We want to have those different crayons and markers available for everybody. But ultimately, it's what's underneath that makes us us. And as we work together here at UUCBB to create beloved community, we want to share our stories with one another so we really know the real us. All right, now everyone, please join me in singing our children out to religious education. She is in the hospital. Um, that's somebody I know about. Uh, anybody else have anything they want to share? We want to, of course, send out all our hopes and prayers to the Ukrainian people who don't deserve this. I, I have a concern um, with the um, with what's going on with trans kids. Um, my, I have many and have taught many students who come to me as their music teacher, somebody they can trust, and they open up to me and they say, Mr. Dable, I, I want you to call me this, and these are the pronouns I use, and this is who I am. And, and I will, I've been told by counselors, this is who they are, and we're going to use these pronouns, and we're going to use this name. I know that's not what it says on your roll sheet. And, and these kids struggle, y'all. They struggle hard. It's so hard for them. And we as teachers do everything we can do to support them. And now here we are in the situation where potentially we as their protectors have to turn them in because there's potential child abuse going on. We need a voice. Everybody needs a voice. You've got to speak out right now because it's, this is so scary for these kids. I have one that I have kept help to keep alive for the past three years, and I worry about him every day right now because of what is going on in our country. So my concern is for, for those that need that. Good news is last Friday, a judge in Trucks County put a stay on it. So it's not 
happening right now. But everybody, call your people. Last week I shared that uh, Jason's aunt wasn't doing well, and so she did pass away on Monday. Teresa Dabbs, and uh, again his his mom has these three sisters, and so she's the first, you know, of all um, everyone her age to to pass. So the viewings tonight, and then the funerals tomorrow, and so I've just been praying so much for her two daughters that are my age and uh, and what they're going. My concern is certainly related to Joe's, is that we have a governor and an attorney general who don't seem to know anything about genetics. unspoken joys and un unspoken sorrows. This one is not going to be the one. <laughs> so we have a reading by Bell Hooks. To me, all the work I do is built on a foundation of loving kindness. Love illuminates matters. And when I write provocative social and cultural criticism that causes readers to stretch their minds, to think beyond set paradigms, I think of that work as love in action. While it may challenge, disturb, and at times even frighten or enrage readers, love is always the place where I begin and end. Think about how you've been identified your whole life. What are the things that describe you? How do other people box you? Are you a woman? Are you from Texas? Are you from another state? What's your skin color? Your race? Are you multi multiracial? Who are you? Are you rich? Are you poor? What's your class? You have all these identities. Can you think of all your identities? How many people want to push out of their identities at some point? You don't like something about it. It limited you in some way. The crayon story is an excellent example. If every kid you saw on TV was white, if every drummer you always saw was a boy, if every... Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Every single identity, if you're not exposed to other people who are wider and you're taught either verbally or non-verbally to believe that only certain things are allowed, that's really limiting. And sometimes if you know you're different and you know it from the time you're born, I'm just speaking from experience here, where you realize that you are not like the other people. And you go, oh no, what can I, where can I compromise? Where can I bend to be more acceptable? Because we all want community, right? Community is a very powerful and important element. What I want to talk to you today is about my hero, Bell Hooks, whose real name was Glenda Watkins. But she is from Kentucky, like I am. She's a little bit older than me. I met her when I was a young student. And at the University of Kentucky, there was an uh, English professor there who didn't have tenure, who started a, a conference called the Kentucky Women's Writers Conference. This is in the 70s. She never got tenure, but she put all her energy into making this thing happen. 
And she invited Alice Walker before people knew who Alice Walker was. Bill Hooks was there. Uh, Audrey Rich was there. Every famous woman writer you can imagine was there. I got to hang out with those people and be around them and just the essence of Bell Hooks. I was too shy to talk to her, but she was there and I was listening to her. Do you all know who she is? Let me tell you a little bit about her. She was an author, she was a professor, she was a poet, she was a feminist, she was a social critic. She often crossed her identities and what she's known for is she changed feminism in the second wave of feminism, about 1981, when she was 19 years old, and she was still a freshman at Stanford <laughs> University, she wrote a book, Ain't I a Woman, where she talked about how feminism was going to be less if it stayed in its white-centric model, if they didn't allow people to talk about being working class or being of color, then feminism was never going to work. It was inherently racist. And I know that's really hard to think about. If you're a feminist, whether you're male or female, you can be a feminist. It's not a, not a problem. Um, but if you look back into the history of feminism, you have to deal with the fact that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and even our beloved Susan B. Anthony, they had some racist beliefs. And it actually slowed down uh, women getting the right to vote. So, Bell Hooks is this person who was born in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Hopkinsville is like Bryan. It's, it's, it's a town that maybe nobody close to here, people around here know where Bryan is, but people in New York City don't know where Bryan is, right? Hopkinsville is like that. It's on the Tennessee border of Kentucky. It's a little bitty town. Her father was a janitor and her mother uh, cleaned houses, was a maid. And she was the fourth of seven kids. But she was just pure brilliant. She was pure brilliant and she uh, worked really hard and she read, um, even, when she, even when she was older, she read at least two mysteries a day and one nonfiction book every day. Crazy, right? She died last year in December at 69. Um, she'd written 40 books. 40. On everything from uh, love, race, class, gender, art, history, sexuality, mass media, and feminism. She wrote about gangster rap, and she wrote about uh, black rights, and how uh, how this is where I wanted you to think about your identities. I think her strongest thing, if I was going to say anything about her, was that she was, uh, she saw the intersections of different struggles. So you can't really solve one without dealing with all of them. We, we know this. We know it, but it's hard, right? Because it's easier to talk about the things that you can talk about. It's easier for me to talk about gay rights or non being non-binary than it is for me to fight for social justice for everybody. You know, because it's closer, I feel safe, I can talk about it, I have some authority about that, that that's my lived experience. But what we need to do is be more like Bell Hooks. Now, Bell Hooks was not a real name, and she took that name, it's her maternal great-grandmother's name. And she used small letters because she felt that her work was more important than her personality. And so when you see Bell Hooks, it'll always be in small case letters. But she's honoring her maternal great-grandmother, and she's also saying, hey, it's not about me. It's about what I'm saying. Don't look at me. Listen to my words. Read my words. And, and she's pretty well read everywhere, but also has many enemies. She talks about really complicated things. She's a truth teller. So one of the things she does is tell the truth about even little things. She says, she said in one article, she said, um, you know, when my family members ask me, buy me a present and ask me if I like it, I tell them. 
And they say, oh, I don't mind. Tell me what you really think. And then she does, and they don't like it. <laughs> Being that much of a truth teller is dangerous. How true can you tell the story? She's a complicated human being. Um, you all can see these pictures of her from various eras. See how she's looking at you in that black and white photo? She calls that the oppositional gaze. And she talks about how black women, especially during slavery, were not allowed to look at their masters. They were not allowed to make eye contact, especially women. This is true for, uh, for slaves, male slaves as well. But that oppositional gaze is an act of defiance. And when black artists make their own art and make their own movies and make their own films, and they're, they're committing an act of, of defiance. So it's called the oppositional gaze. And they don't have to smile at you. How many women here were raised that you're supposed to smile all the time? Do, do, guys, did you ever get tell, told that you don't have to? Or you just knew it because you saw other guys do it? There's a difference in how people are raised. Not everybody. I mean, there are certain there's occasions where people cross over, but you gotta admit to it before we can deal with it. You know what I'm saying? We gotta talk about it. There's a lot of terrible things that, uh, there's a great book, I can't remember the name of the book. Meg, can you think of the name of the book? Where the, the woman passed as a man and, and like lived as a man for a couple of years and then wrote a book about it. I can remember the book, but not the name, sorry. It's a Penguin book, I can't think of the title of it. But what was interesting about the book was her, she realized how different friendships were and the expectations of friendship and the expectations of males, and she, she felt had a lot more sympathy for men. Just because you have the power doesn't mean you don't get socialized to behave in a certain way. So what if you're gonna push against all these boundaries? Now, Bell Hooks fell in love with a, another graduate student at Stanford who was about eight years older than her. And he had a lot more, um, this is the 60s, in the early 70s. They never got married. They had an open relationship. It was the 60s, it was the 70s. But um, they really tried to talk to each other and they really tried to do feminism, you know? And it didn't work because they just couldn't get past every aspect of it. They couldn't get past every aspect of it to the point that Bell Hooks being a truth teller and always looking at how she felt about things and, and all that, she came to think of herself as queer. She said she called herself queer past gay, and the past coming from, from uh, French, the French idea of not. I am not this, I'm going to push against this. And so even though most of her partners uh, early in her life were male, and then later she called herself queer past gay, she says it's not who I'm having sex with. It's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is I'm pushing up against how everything is done. Everything. So she took on Spike Lee, early on in Spike Lee's career, and she said, well, you know, there's a lot, you're accepting a lot of the expectations of you as a black man in your movies. I want you to question that. Push past it. So she always got talked about as a black intellectual, and she was, Cornel West and, and Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks and uh, Deet Nhat Hanh had hung out all the time. You can read lots of her articles in uh, Lion's War and other Buddhist things. Because what she realized, her main theme throughout her life was about love. And that's what I wanted to talk to you all about, but it's so difficult to talk about her and not talk about all these other things too. So she wrote a book called Love is All. And she calls herself a Christian Buddhist spiritual seeker. So she's looking at all these different things. And she's looking at love. And she says love is what's required to do social justice. You have to love people. You can't just throw money at them. 
You can't just keep them at a distance. The homeless people have to stay over there, and you're over here. If you're gonna do it right, you gotta love people. Love is what makes community. Love is what makes us have real relationships with each other, and building community requires love. That is a radical thing to say. I'm feeling my hair on the back of my neck stand up, because it's scary to talk about it. You sound like, I don't know, naive, perhaps. But I want to uh, read you a couple of quotes. The other thing I want to say about bell hooks uh, that Alfred Hirsch said, bell hooks exploded the false binary between the personal and the academic through her truth telling. So if you read, if you've not read any of her books, you've got 40 to choose from. Okay. Everything from a memoir, she wrote children's books, she has four children's books. She wrote lots and lots of essays. You can read her Buddhist work. You could, you know, just search bell hooks. There's lots of nice YouTubes of her talking on various talk shows and stuff. And so you get a sense of her essence. Because I tell you what, when I met her, and I was about this far away from her, the vibe coming out of her, I, would, I wanted that. I want that. Whatever it is. I want to tell the truth that way, even if it makes people uncomfortable. And she was loving the entire time. So how do you tell the truth and be loving when you're mad as hell and you can't take it anymore? All those things are true about Bell Hooks. I think her love is all book is a classic and will last through time. Um, because she not only talks about self-love, which is how, how difficult that is, but also how to be an activist. And love is what's required to be a really effective activist. And so I hope you check her out. Um, I was going to read you a quote. Oh, yes. OK. Lots of bell hooks quotes in the world. To begin by always thinking of love as an action rather than a feeling is one way in which anyone using the word in this matter automatically assumes accountability and responsibility. Pretty awesome. Yeah, I wanted to read you what she said about being queer past gay, too. Let me find that. Sometimes, you know, you have a goal to do a sermon, and, you, and it's easy, and you just do it. And sometimes I go, I really should talk about bell hooks because I'm scared to talk about bell hooks. And then you try to put it together into a 15 minute, 20 minute sermon, and it sounds like this. So, there you go. I'm doing my best. You're doing great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to keep trying to take risks. Okay. Let's see what I've got to here. Um, if y'all want recommendations of books, I can tell you. She, she has three degrees, her um, undergraduate degrees from Stanford, coming from Hopkinsville, Kentucky, with no money. She was brilliant. She must have tested off the charts to get to do that. And then she got her master's um, at Madison, in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then she wrote her PhD at the University of California at Santa Cruz on Toni Morrison. I kind of put her in a, in a camp with Audre Lorde and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker, you know, uh, amazing, Cornel West, people like that. Um, she's brilliant both talking about, she can talk about capitalism all day, she can talk about patriarchy all day. She challenges everybody. She doesn't leave anybody alone. And, uh, but she's real funny, too. I mean, I hope you check her out on YouTube so you can hear her. Has, uh, she has a sense of humor, and she's real loving. And she meets people, and she goes, have you read? Have you met? That's what you want in a teacher, right? She wrote a really good book about teaching, too. Um, was an excellent professor. Taught at the New School often. She was often a guest lecturer at the New School. And it's about 2004, she moved back to Berea, Kentucky. I don't know if y'all know Berea, but Berea is an amazing school. 
It's one of the 10 schools in the country that you can work your way through school. You have to be brilliant and poor to get in. That's, you know, Appalachian kids and people from all over get into Berea and they work. So if you're an artist, um, you would make pottery or brooms or, and, and, that, and that is how you pay for your school. So it's an amazing school. And they opened a Bell Hook Center there, an institute. So all her papers are there if you're ever in Kentucky. I, I highly recommend it. Um, makes me homesick when I hear her because she's got such a Kentucky accent. Um, I'm looking for that quote. But... Oh, OK, here we go. It says, regarding her sexual identity, Hook identified herself as queer, past, gay. She used the term pas from the French language translated as not into English. Hook describes being queer in her own words as not who you're having sex with, but about being at odds with everything about it. I feel that way. It's so nice that somebody put it into words. Um, she spent the last 17 years of her life uh, asexual, which is... Uh, you know, interesting too. That she just, her whole life was about love. And she died of having a kidney failure. So I'm not sure whether it was diabetes related or whatever, but she was 69. Um, I hope you got something out of this and that wasn't too uh, out there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kyle. Now, will an offering be taken to sustain and strengthen this place? It's good. <laughs> Which is sacred to so many of us, a community of memory and of hope, for we are now the keepers of the dream. I'm going to sing you another one of my songs. This is um, called The Living Tree. And uh, it came about because I have a picture on my wall of the championship girls basketball team from 1921. And my great aunt Anna was on that team. And so when I'm feeling small in the world, I look at that picture and go, I come from championship stock. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that's the picture in the song. champions 1921 I see the kindness and the power in the people I come from but I feel the wind blow through me I'm afraid I'm not that strong can you help me find a way to carry me on I can feel their expectations father mother son and you wonder if you've made it was there more you could have done we weren't meant to matter much when they told us with their eyes and in their blood. How did we change our fortunes? How do we change our fortunes? Rewrite our destiny. Rewrite our destiny. Reach deep inside our beauty. Reach deep inside our beauty. By the roots of stand beside you, friends that walk away, there are places that can hold you, places you can't stay, and I'm reaching high my branches, sinking deep to water flow, this is the truest wisdom that I know, how we change our fortunes, how do we change our fortunes? Bye. 
organizations with which we work. This month, we're proud to support Tiny Hope Village, a nonprofit organization formed to provide a permanent housing solution for people who have experienced homelessness in the Bryan College Station and Hearn area. Thank you for your generosity. We appreciate these gifts that we have given for those we receive and for each other. May your generosity return to you tenfold. And now, I welcome Deb Wilson, to share with us. John's gonna help me out for a second. I'm from Tennessee. You'll figure that out in a minute. under 60, you probably don't know who Minnie Pearl is. But if you don't, look her up, because she was a hoot. She appeared on the Grand Ole Opry for 50 years. Her signature look was a straw hat with a price tag hanging down in front. And that was really faux pas. Her howdy was legendary. I did a pretty good job, didn't I? And you thought only Aggies were the ones who said that, right? No. Mm. I thought of Minnie Pearl when I was thinking about what I wanted to say this morning. The word price. She always had that price tag on her hat and it always made me chuckle. But the word price stuck in my head this morning. Price is something you pay for something that you value. Price is something you pay for something that you think is worthwhile. Price is something you pay for a service or a product. I think of these things when I think of our church. This church is worth a lot to me. I value it. And when I think of the service it provides, well, Lordy, I think it's a bargain. I know a good thing when I see it. And friends, this is a good thing. And for us to keep a good thing, we have to support it, we have to take care of it, and we have to create an everlasting legacy. When I think of stewardship, I think of taking care of something, making something better, creating a legacy that is sustainable. What's your idea of stewardship? Hmm? Does it involve time? Oh yeah, just ask all of our volunteers who volunteer for committees on the board who carry our banners and for protests and charity work. Does it involve time? Oh yeah, it involves a lot of time. And does it involve money? You bet your sweet bippy it does. It takes a lot of treasure for us to make this thing work. So this is the time of year when we focus on, focus on treasure. 
I want to know how many of you got up this morning and said, golly, I can't wait to get to church so I can ask somebody for some money. <laughs> how many of you got up this morning and said, man, I can't wait to ask somebody to get on my committee and I want them to do all the work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, how many of you got up this morning and said, what's our next fundraiser? I want to chair it. Well, probably none. But all of that is what it takes to make this work. We're all at different stages in our lives. Some of us have more time that we can give. Some of us have talent, haven't found found fun, fun yet. And then some of us can contribute financially more than others. It takes us all to make it work. Katie Womack isn't here today, but Dina, raise your hand, Dina, and Pam, and Pastor Kaya and I make up the stewardship committee. It's a bit daunting, to be honest with you, to be responsible for raising the funds for next year's budget. Our employees' salaries depend on it. Our programs depend on it. Our future depends on it. I know we can all pitch in and do our part. In the next month, we're going to be having some cottage dinners. For the newbies out there, cottage dinners are offered as a way for you to get to know other people in the congregation. We come together in a host home. The host typically um, provides the entree. We bring, the guests usually bring a side dish or dessert, and it never hurts to have a little wine. So bring a bottle or two, you'll need it. The host will contact you once you sign up. Pam and Dina have sign-up sheets. I'll have a sign-up sheet. So find us after church and sign up. If you're not in the directory, make sure you have your phone number and email. Um, the sign-up sheets will tell you if it's kid-friendly. It'll tell you if it's vegetarian. It'll tell you, you know, what time and all of that. So it's a wonderful way to get to know other members and discuss this, the importance of this church to you and your family. As many Pearl would say, <laughs> look, I'm pleased as punch and just proud to be here. <laughs> hey, thank you, Deb. Now, Please join me in extinguishing the chalice, the words on the wall. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we gather together again. Well, before I let you go, I want to thank Joe for helping me out with the sound today, everybody who helped set up. Thank you, Molly, for being our worship associate. Thank you, Deb, for talking for our stewardship. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate you, John. Everything you do, it's too long a list. And Allison. But uh, I'm supposed to tell you all a couple of things. One, there is a new member class on the 26th from noon to 2 o'clock right here. If you are interested in membership, you don't have to join that at that thing, but you can find out about joining. And if you are a new member and you feel like you need to get be able to ask questions and not be embarrassed, this is a good time to come and ask questions. Um, we're also going to show a movie um, on the 27th. What time is that, John? Do you know? Um, anyway, check it out. Pay attention to the e-cast. Um, but we're going to have a, a movie about Marsha P. Johnson, who is one of the people who started Stonewall, a transgender person, and they started the Gay Liberation Front. Anyway, it's a documentary about their life that's really good, and you all want to come. So I'm telling you about those things. Those are at the end of the month. But um, we appreciate you all very much. I know Darby's preaching next week, and that'll be really good. And it's right here. So... Um, I'm going to sing you a little bit of our theme for stewardship, which is in, I think it's 1017 in the teal hymnal if you want to sing. 
but I was just going to sing your verse. We are building a new way. say, is that really what I want to be doing? Is that really who I want to be? Go in peace.